I'm going to try to talk about the second piece of the puzzle. The way that we break it down is that when we're doing these types of drills, it's more in small group settings, it is more one-on-one, -on -one, guys rolling out before practice. But once practice starts, then we start focusing more on the actual approach side of things. So we view it as two pieces. The individual player, how we can help them, and then the team side of things of the approach. And so I'm going to talk about the second piece here. So really, like the importance of having an approach. Why is it even important? How many pitching coaches do we have here? Not many. Not many. So every pitching coach, every guy on the mound throwing that ball has a plan for how he wants to get a hitter out. It is the hitter's responsibility to have some tool in his toolbox to be able to counter what that pitcher is trying to do. And you have to have different, different options. As a team, you can't practice one approach and expect it to fall, like every pitcher you face to fall into that category. You have to have different options, and you have to be able to evolve and adapt to what that guy on the mound is doing. So when we, when we start really looking at approaches, in our, in our eyes, there's really two parts of the, of the approach that fall under an umbrella here. There's less than two strikes, and there's two strikes. For us, less than two strikes, we're here in the driver's seat. We determine when we swing. It doesn't matter if it's 0-1. Doesn't matter. We are in the driver's seat with less than two strikes. We have the ability to utilize any approach that we have. Okay? Now, when we get to two strikes, the other side of the approach, now we have to be a little bit more defensive, and that pitcher now gets to determine when we swing. So, when we start looking at the less than two strikes, there's two parts to that, too. There's the lane for which we are hunting, and there's the pitch speed that we're hunting. So when you start looking at those two, you have three options for your lane, and you have really three pitch speed approaches that we, that we work with. And as I get into this, we will kind of start pairing those together. So these are the lanes. When we, when we hunt lanes, we hunt five baseballs. So you'll see some video here in a little bit. When we're in the cages and our guys are hitting, we have five baseballs screwed together. One, two, three, four, five. So every time when we are hitting in the cage, we have an umpire behind and he is calling location. He is helping that hitter understand, okay, that's ball five. Oh, that's a little too far, ball one. So those guys start to process where these balls are, are crossing. It's 11 inches. The strike zone, roughly 22 inches. We're covering 11 inches at all times with less than two strikes. Okay, so the way that we determine what lane that we want to use is based on how we're being pitched. And, it, and it's really pitch specific, and, and I'll get into that a little bit more in a second too. Uh, but as we move those lanes, we make physical adjustments in the box. So we have a consistent spot with where we start in the box. If you're not consistent with where you start in the box, then your feel for where ball five should be and ball one should be, your inside and outside boundaries is going to vary and you're going to really struggle. So we have to be very consistent with where we start in the box to have a feel for that. Then, if we decide that we want to shift our balls over and sit away, the middle, the middle play, now we're covering one ball off back to middle. We will physically move. So think of it in terms of not necessarily the play, but think of it in terms of our in relationship distance from our body. As I move, my hitting is all move. So at all times, I'm still covering the same distance from my body. And if I want to sit in, then I need to give space and back up off the play. And some examples of these as a right-handed right right hitter is maybe you're facing the lefty with a little bit of arm side run. He's just living out there, living out there, living out there. Or maybe you're facing a guy that's sinking it down and in. You have the ability to move in the box so that you can create space or cover ground to be able to cover those pitches. When we're covering these five balls, we always look balls five and adjust to one. Why do we look away and adjust in? Because physically it's, it's better, it's easier to be able to adjust working in. And as I'm going looking away, it puts me in a better hitting position versus looking in and trying to adjust the leg. That's almost impossible. Always ball five to ball one. Okay? So then you look at the pitch, the pitch side of things. Okay? 
We have fastball spit, we have fastball adjust, and we have sit off speed. Those are the three things that, that we are able to pair with those lanes. If you want to look through the order of use, fastball spit, hands down, not even close, that is the most common one that we will use. Then we start sitting off speed, then fastball adjust. So fastball spit, that is a, that is a guy that, um, like we are, not, we are not swinging at his breaking ball. This may be your first at bat of the game, Maybe you've never seen it. Maybe you've never seen this breaking ball. It's hard to go up there and handle a breaking ball that I've never seen. So I want to see the shape of it. I want to see the, the feel. What's the velocity like? How much bite does it have? Like I want to have some feel for it before I even want to handle it. If you were to take your hitter in the cage and set up a breaking ball and tell him to swing at the very first one, probably not going to go great. You let him see one, then he's got a better chance of success. So never seen the off speed. Maybe the off speed's not consistently a strike. If he's not landing that, that all speed at a, at a decent, you know, a decent rate, I'm not going to honor him. He can have it. He can throw it all he wants. And if he wants to keep throwing it, I'm just going to walk to first base. I'm not honoring it one bit. Then uh, maybe the off speed's a really, really good pitch. Maybe it's an 84 mile an hour slider. I want no part of that. I want zero part of that. So those are the fastball spit guys. Maybe sit off speed. This is a situation where maybe you have a middle of your Maybe like an Ethan Petri, who knows? Like some of these middle order guys that maybe they've got spun first pitch, first couple of pitches, their first two at bats. Maybe they're coming up their third at bat. Maybe now that you've seen it, he started you out with it. Maybe now's the time to sit on it. So now maybe you've seen the breaking ball. It is consistently a strike, and it's a hittable pitch. Okay, now we have the, the option to be able to sit on it. Then fastball adjusts. This is the hardest one. And again, these are less than two strikes. Fastball adjust. This is the hardest one. Now I'm trying to cover two pitches. Fastball spit, I was covering one pitch. Fastball. Sitting off speed, covering one pitch. Breaking ball. Fastball adjust, covering two pitches. That's tough. So the fastball adjust, again, I've seen the breaking ball. I know the shape. I know the rhythm. I know the feel of it. It is consistently a strike, and it's hit them. But the problem with trying to cover two pitches is... Now, my rhythm and my timing is covering two pitches, and guys have a tendency to get caught between. And you're just slightly late on that fastball, and you foul it off, and you're just slightly out front of that breaking ball, and you catch it out front, and you hit just a weak fly ball. It becomes very hard. So in our eyes, covering one pitch at a time is much more easy, and you have a better chance of success than covering multiple pitches. Um, the, the, again, I talk about the order of the use, order of use, um, and then we can take these and we can pair them with the lanes where we're looking. I know this might seem a little complicated and seem like a lot, but it's really not. As you start to work with your guys and start practicing, and you realize it's, it's pretty simple. Um, so you can take all three lanes and you can pair them with the pitch you're looking. So if you're sitting away, you can go fastball spin, sit away, <coughs> sit off speed, sit away. That may be a situation where it's a right, you're facing a right-handed pitcher and he's just kind of landing that breaking ball out there on that outside corner over and over again. And if you hold your spot in the box, you're going to catch it off the end of the bat. So let's move it a little bit closer so that we can get to the barrel on that pitch. And then, um, I'm sorry, I have fastball spin on there twice. Fastball adjust sit away. Okay? I will say this, on fastball adjust, if you choose to go to fastball adjust, the best situation to use fastball adjust is is when you're sitting away on the fastball, somebody's living away with their fastball, and they're, they're leaving the breaking ball middle. It's easier to adjust the pitches work that are in to you than away. So if you're choosing to go fastball adjust, being closer to the plate, covering the fastball that's black away, and hammering the breaking ball that he leaves the middle is the best case scenario. But outside that, again, that's a pretty tough uh, approach to have. Um, middle here, fastball spit, sit off speed, and it should be fastball adjust. You can use all three middle. Then sit in, fastball spit, sit off speed. Rarely do you sit in and go fastball adjust. That's just not really, that's not really going to come into play a ton. So who determines what approach the batter uses? It's not the batter. The batter doesn't get to choose what approach the, the, he uses. It's the pitcher. It's the pitcher that determines what approach the batter uses. If you know everybody wants to, you know, everybody wants to hit home runs. You say I'm going to go up there and I'm going to sit in. Well, if he's not throwing it in, 
you're going to be walking back to the dugout. It's based on how you're being pitched that will determine what approach to use. Okay? And you have to start thinking through some different things. Lefties versus righties. It, you know, maybe it's a maybe it's a right-handed pitcher and it's slider to the righties and change to the lefties. So as a lefty, maybe you don't need to go sit on the slider if he's not using it against you and he's using it to righties. So as you're communicating in the dugout and you're starting to establish what plan that you need to have, you have to consider how is he pitching lefties, how is he pitching the righties, because it's not always the same. There's situations where guys will live on one side of the plate with their fastball. Maybe he's living glove side as a right-handed pitcher. Well, the righties need to sit away. The lefties actually need to probably sit in and give him a little space. Does that make sense? So it varies righties versus lefties, power versus contact. He may not pitch the nine-hole guy the exact same way he pitches a three-hole guy. So understanding how he's pitching guys that are similar to you in the lineup. And then situation, you know, like... What does he do with runners in scoring position? What does he do when nobody's on? Like, what does he do with the first batter of, the, of every inning? Start to understand situations when you're, when you're figuring out the plan of attack. So some questions to be able to ask yourself. Like, everybody, I, I don't know, how many people in here do scouting reports as you're preparing to play other teams? So a couple. So a couple. Scouting reports have one absolute, and that is they're not always going to be accurate. They're not. They're not. You can, you can watch video of guys all you want. You know, he's a breaking ball guy. He's going to come in. Well, he may come in out of pen, and he may not have it that day. He may be locating his fastball better than he ever has. Like, baseball is a, a game where, like, you really don't know what you're going to get. Every single day is a little bit different. So you create this scouting report, and you think you have a plan, but really the best scouting report is created in the dugout, on the fly, as we're going through this, what are we seeing? What is he today? What, ad what adjustments can we make to be able to, to adapt to him? So questions you have to be able to ask, like, okay, like as those dudes are getting at bats and they're coming back and talking to the other hitters, like where's the fastball lo located? Where is it finishing? What is the shape of it? You know, is he living on one side of the plate? Um, all speed location, is it sharp? Can you see it early? Is it down? Is it, is it more of a chase pitch finishing, finishing just off the plate? Where does it have to start? Um, you know, like, what is he consistently throwing for strikes? Like, yeah, hey, like, he's throwing that breaking ball a lot, but it's not a strike. Or there are situations where you'll face guys that are throwing their fastball, fastball, breaking ball, pretty even mixed, but you look back at it, and his fastball really was never a strike. When he needed to break, when he needed to strike, he's going to the breaking ball. Um, what does he throw with runners in scoring position? So really, like, how fast can we get to plan B? That is it. Every game, you will start, you will have a plan. For, for us, 90% of the time, it's probably going to be fastball, spit, middle, get into the game and figure it out. And then we do a good job communicating in the dugout, how are we being pitched, what adjustments can we make, what is the right approach for this guy, and then how quickly can we adjust. When I, you know, like, I look back at my career and some of the times that we would make an adjustment because we've done a good job communicating in the dugout. We would make an adjustment and we would get to the guy on the mound in the fourth inning and, inning and hit a home run and you finish the game and you look up and that was the difference in the game. If, well, if we end up dragging our feet and don't do a good job communicating, then maybe we don't make that adjustment fast enough and we lose. So you never know which at bat is going to change the game. So really it becomes a race. How well can we communicate and how quickly can we get to plan B? When you start looking at some of this stuff, here's just kind of some additional notes. If you're facing someone that has really, really good stuff, again, like I'm covering one pitch. I only want to cover one pitch. A fastball spit or sit off speed. I'm facing somebody with good stuff and I'm trying to cover multiple pitches, I have no shot. If I'm facing somebody with really, really good command and I want to go up there and I want to hunt middle, I'm probably going to be hitting 0-2 a lot. So, Based on if that guy has really good command, I need to either sit away or sit in based on what, I, what my teammates are communicating to me, what my previous at-bats have been like. Or if I'm facing somebody with really, really good stuff, I need to really sell out and hone in on one pitch. And so why is having an approach important? Why is it important? Well, you start really looking at it. If you're hunting smaller lanes and specific pitches, then I have a better chance of quality contact. Well, if I have a better chance of quality contact, now I'm going to have more extra base hits. 
I have more extra base hits, I'm going to score more runs. I score more runs, we win. It's that simple. So it all goes back to hunting specific lanes and pitches and being disciplined there. And then from there, my, my contact quality gets better and I start driving some balls and we start scoring more runs. So again, like Coach Lee was talking about, we've created the culture of being able to hit the ball hard. Like we, we want to hit the ball hard. It's important. And why is it important? Like, what can we take? It's not just about hitting the ball hard. Like, what is it that we can take away from that? Really, it's swing decisions. It's swing decisions. And so if I'm in a less than two strike situation, like, and I can't hit this ball hard, then it's a take for me. So I'll say this, and you guys, some, some of you guys may, may find this interesting, some may disagree. I don't believe, I don't believe in strike or ball with less than two strikes. When we're, when we're in the cages, we're doing things, guys, take pitch, hey, that's right. I'm like, that's not the question to ask. That is not the question to ask. Strike ball, irrelevant to me. With less than two strikes, the question is, can I hit it hard? Should I hit that ball off the wall? Can I hit it out of the park? If the answer is no, then it's a great take. For us, it's a great take. You know what? Like, if you're sitting on the breaking ball, and he rolls it right down the middle, or you're sitting fastball away, and he dots it right there exactly where you're looking, and you take it, and you just felt like maybe I didn't quite see it. I didn't quite, I, my rhythm was off. My timing was off. Great take. Great take. Not strike or ball. Can I do damage or not? That's it. When I get to two strikes, it's a different question. So when we, when we do this, like we will, we will, Mike, Mike he, every day near BP, Mike's always, he's, he's charting, like logging our exit B loads. Every day when we take batting practice, exit B loads posted on the scoreboard. I mean, dudes get into it. And we try to acknowledge, we try to acknowledge when someone hits a personal record. And, it, and they try to make it a big deal. But we have everybody's max exit velo. Let's just say, you know, some, we have a player that's max exit velo is 100 miles an hour. Well, 90% of that is 90 miles per hour. We try to, every time we swing with less than two strikes, our goal is to hit it 90 or better. We want to live above the 90% mark on every swing with less than two strikes. Because again, if I don't feel like I can live above that 90 mark, then it's probably a take for me. Does that make sense? And then as you're kind of going through this, um, one, one thing to really kind of look at, when we looked at our fall, we felt like we were in pretty good shape. Like 40% of your hits should be extra base hits. That's, that's the goal. 40% of your hits should be extra base hits. Because if, if that number is low, then I have to question, are we swinging at the right pitches with less than two strikes to do damage with? So really, like, the number one determining factor in a hitter's success is how hard he hits the ball. It's just that simple. That's the number one determining factor for a hitter's success. And as you can see right through, as you go through, through here, exit below. As the exit below goes up, batting, batting average and slugging go up. Like, it's that simple. It's that simple. Hit the ball hard, and you're going to be successful. But in order to hit the ball hard, I have to hone in and hunt specific pitches and specific lanes. That's why hitting two, with two strikes is so hard. That's why statistically, the numbers for two strikes is, is tough, man, because now you're covering multiple pitches in bigger lanes. With less than two strikes, we're trying to do the opposite of that. This is a sheet, what it looks like. You know, when we send out to our guys, you know, Mike, he'll, he'll chart um, he'll chart our BP, like those machines that, that uh, Coach Lee was talking about, breaking balls one day, I think this was actually, yeah, I think this was a breaking ball day, uh, one of the breaking balls. But every day when we're hitting off those machines, exit view is posted on the scoreboard, well, this goes into a, uh, a spreadsheet and, and we send it out to our guys. And so you can see, like, we're trying to create a culture of hitting the ball hard, and those guys take pride in it. Some of the max exit B loads for that day highlighted our personal records for those guys. Then our 90% mark, like what I talked about, and then our average exit B load right there. So ideally, we want our average exit B load for the day to be greater than the 90% mark. If our, if our average exit B load is below our 90% mark, then I have to question, I have to question, where are we swinging at the right pitches? So in training, what does that look like? You know, like, again, like, 
exit velocity is, is, is king, man. Like it's the number one determining factor for success. So some different ways, like we have, we have resources that are unbelievable that we can use. But you can do stuff as simple as 3 two, one contact rate. When you're doing VP and you're doing different things, you can grade out. Three is quality contact, one's weak contact, two's average. You can keep a running total. You can find ways to, to measure those things. Create competitions. Get guys to lock in a little bit more. And you know, we create some pretty, pretty tough environments. And your environments should be, with less than two strikes that you're working on, should be forcing guys to make decisions. You should be making decisions at all times when you're when you're when you're training. Um, so, like we said, like Coach Lee said, like we, I think maybe I threw five times in the fall, and it was all mixed. And we've been fortunate enough to get our get a, a new machine that allows us to mix pitches. So, like my days of throwing are, are over with because this machine can do it. And you'll see some video of it in a little bit. But force guys to make decisions, mix, so that you can work on fastball spin, spin on, spinning on the breaking ball. You know, roll breaking balls in there so you can sit on it. You can move the fastball around and sit away and sit in. Um, Two-head machine, you can set up multiple machines. Not like what you saw earlier with uh, Coach Lee's video, but you can set them directly in line with the mini hack in front and the big hack behind and slide them up close and have one as a breaking ball and one as a fastball. We've done that many times where you, they don't know which one you're going to feed, let go of one, fastball. They don't know which one you're going to feed, let go of breaking ball. And they can, there's those... those uh, those exit points are, are pretty good in line. Like it's, it's, it's a pretty good drill. Force guys to make decisions there. Um, if you're using single machine, move it around. Don't just set it up middle, middle. Make it and let your guys take mindless swing after mindless swing. Make them make decisions. Um, every time, every time you're doing drill work, one out of every four pitches should be a take. It should be a take. Not because like he just takes a pitch middle, it should be slightly out of the zone, down, up, whatever. One out of every four, so that those guys are constantly staying engaged mentally, making decisions, tracking pitches, understanding what lane they're hunting. So here is um, fastball spin middle. So you can see the five balls at the plate. Um, we have a machine set up that is, that is, again, like mixing pitches. And then, how do I get this to play, guys? Got it right here. <laughs> Not going to play. You just hit the answer. Not sure. This is what you got. I saw my video. Oh, here we go. All right. And so he's hunting middle. Fastball middle, hunting middle. And then this machine allows us to mix in breaking balls. And his rhythm and timing is, is convicted on that fastball. Anything off that rhythm and timing, that was ball six or seven, that was too far out. Again, he's covering five baseball. Probably a little too far in ball one, maybe even zero. Again, covering five baseball. Anything that is off that rhythm or outside of those lanes is a take. It was a breaking ball. He is selling out on the fastball. One thing that I did not talk about is whether we are whether we are sitting away, whether we are sitting middle, or we're sitting in. We never really predetermined where we're going to hit the ball. <laughs> My hitting lane with less than two strikes is moving with me as I move in the box. So if I'm sitting in and I get ball five, which is my outside boundary, and I'm sitting in, I can hit that ball off out backside. Like it's fine. I can actually sit away to a lefty that's living away, 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 and he may miss middle. And I, even though I'm sitting away, I can actually still, I can still hit the ball full side. So really, it's a it's distance from my body. Is it outside, the outside lane distance from my body or inside distance from my body? This is fastball, spit, sit away. Again, you can see five baseballs slid over. Ball five is right there on the black. And he's taking the breaking ball, hitting the fastball. You can see where the ball, the ball one ends. Anything further in, closer to him, is a take. Ball four, four and a half there. Too far. Ball six.
So we train, we train with our, our outside boundary right there at that black, maybe even a slightly more, but not much, not much. But the thing that um, that's unique, that we train this way, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're locked into this. There's two things that determine how far we shift our five ball lane. Number one, where is that guy consistently pitching to us? So I know you guys may or not dealing with the same, same strike zone as we are. You know, two balls off may be a strike. Well, if that guy's living out there two balls off the plate consistently, and the second thing, that umpire is going high, high, then you have to cover it. You can go back to the dugout, coach, that's two balls off, man. Like, that's two balls off. Well, it's probably a ball. I get that. But if you're not, if you're not going to make any type of adjustment, you're going to lose. And nobody's going to care. Like, they're just going to see loss. So the two things that determine how far we move our five ball lane is where I'm consistently being pitched, where he's locating it, and what's being called a strike. If he's living two balls off and that umpire's saying ball, ball, then I don't have to go that far. If he's living one ball off, that umpire's high, high, then we have to be able to adjust in the box and move our five baseball lanes where he's pitching us to cover. Does that make sense? So, yes. Hey, one thing, talk to them a little bit about, like, with not having this type of resource at their disposal, being able to do it with coach pitch. Like, if you have somebody on staff who can mix and, like, how we do that, you know, when we do a coach pitch, uh, like, how do we do that? In, when we do that on the field. Yeah, yeah. So, again, like some of the things that you can use is coach pitch mix. You can mix pitches for sure. Um, like I said, the two hat, the mini hat, and the big hat, you can set them up in line so the one, like the top, the big hat is a breaking ball, the mini hat is a fastball. You hold up both balls, put them on the ramp, let go of one. Now you've got a chance to mix pitches at a little bit better speed. The way that we set this up and we like, kind of rotate through this, this is what's happening in the cage. At the exact same time, half our hitters, so we, we bring it right now, we're in a smaller group setting, so right now we have five guys per group. Two guys are in the cage doing this, while the other three are on the field hitting with Coach Lee doing the two machines that you saw. That takes about 10 minutes, then we flip. And then those three guys are on the field coming here. The way that I've been rotating guys through this is, we've gone two days right-handed pitcher, two days left-handed pitcher. Day one, and day one, day one of right-handed pitcher and day one of left-handed pitcher is the exact same. Day two of right-handed pitcher and day, uh, day two of left-handed right-handed pitcher is the same. So day one, we'll go fastball, spit, middle, with an occasional just mixing and breaking ball to take. Round two, two strikes. Round three, we'll sit on the off-speed. I personally like, if you're gonna work on sitting on the off-speed pitches, to do two-strike work prior to, or you can do fastball spit, but like I like to sit off speed at the back end of my rounds so that they've had a chance to see some breaking balls in the earlier rounds. I don't like to sit off speed right out of the gate because again, it's hard to sit on a pitch that you don't know what it looks like. So they've had a chance to accumulate like, some information, rounds one, two, three, or whatever it is before you, before you sit on the breaking ball. What was, what was two? Yeah, two strikes. two strikes. So fastball spit middle, two strikes, sit on the breaking ball. Day two of righty and lefty is fastball spit sit away, two strikes, then sit in. That's kind of how, and then honestly, we cover everything we need to right there. Two days righty, two days lefty, and three rounds each. This is fastball spit sit in. You can see five ball slid over. Again, these guys are making physical adjustments in the box. If you hold your ground and you're sitting in and you choose not to move your feet, you're going to get blown up. If you're sitting away and choose not to move your feet, you're going to cap a lot of baseballs. So you have to be able to move and make adjustments in the box. Probably ball zero and touch too far. And again, like I'm back here calling out location. Too far. I'm back here calling location at every swing, like ball one, ball zero, too far, ball six, whatever. And what happens is, as these guys start accumulating this, they do this for a couple weeks. They hear me back there saying it, they hear Coach Lee back there saying the location. After like week three, week four, you hey, where was that? Ball four. And those dudes will be calling in, yep, you're right. Hey, where was that? Ball two. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, where was that? That was ball six. Yep, good take, man. 
And so like good dudes start to figure that out. And so as they're coming back to the, the dugout and communicating in game stuff, they, they are pretty honed in and dialed in on where these pitches are crossing the plate to help you better establish your, your approach. All right, set off speed, middle. Set off speed, middle. One thing that I haven't talked about yet is there's two types of, of training for the breaking ball. There's sit on it, and then there's two strike. If you're working on sitting on it, and you're watching from the side, I'm just watching him hit from an open angle, and I don't pay one bit, uh, one bit attention to the pitch, I probably think he's hitting a fastball, because his rhythm and timing is just flowing right through that thing. There's no pause, there's nothing. I'm just flowing right through it. Now, if I'm watching from the side, and I see that tenth of a second pause then go, then I know he's adjusting. Then that's two strike or fastball adjust. So those are things to keep in mind. When you're hitting, on the, hitting the breaking ball in training, like if you have one machine set up, it's not, and you're working on two strikes, it should not be the sit-off speed rhythm. They should not be flowing right through that. They should be honoring fastball first and adjusting to the off-speed second. So when you're working on off-speed stuff, there's two rhythms. Sit on it, here we're sitting on it, and then there's the fastball adjust, so there should be a tenth of a second pause. And I'll, I'll play this in just a second. One thing to really kind of think about, if you're, if you're facing someone that, that has multiple off-speed pitches, maybe it's a breaking ball and a change-up, and you think that you want, to, you want to try to cover both, typically, again, covering one pitch is better than covering multiple pitches. But if you have a guy that's doing a pretty good job of mixing in some change-ups and a breaking ball, and you think you can cover both, then some of the rules of thumb to think about is, number one, like we want our, the velos of those pitches to be pretty similar so that we are timing and everything is is lined up. And we want to look for the one that's working away from us and adjust to the one working in. So as a right-handed hitter and I'm facing a lefty, I'm going to look for the change-up working away and adjust to the breaking ball working in. If I'm a left-handed hitter, I'm going to look for the change-up working away and the breaking ball working in. It's easier to look away and adjust in than look in and adjust away. Sitting on breaking ball here. And if I were to throw him a fastball, a call fastball on this machine, it probably would look like 100 miles an hour to him because his rhythm and timing is set to the speed of this pitch. Okay? A little in. So two strike, two strike pitch. Other side of the umbrella here. Two strike hitting. Much more difficult. Much more difficult, obviously. But really about 50-52%, you know, that number I can always hear a little bit here and there. 50-52%, let's say, of major league at bats are two strike swings. So if that's the case, if roughly half your swings in major league baseball are two strike swings, then I think that will Shouldn't like close to half of our swings in training and stuff mimic that? Like, so if I'm taking half my swings with two strikes, then I probably should be training with two strikes a fair amount, maybe even close to half as well. And the thing about that is, is if if I have if I'm training two strikes a fair amount, my confidence and ability with two strikes gets better. And the more confidence that I have in my two strike ability, the more selective that I can be with less than two strikes. I can be more honed into my approach and more selective with less than two strikes if I believe in my two strike ability. Guys that they're terrified of striking out typically do what? They're just they're not going to get to two strikes. They're just going to swing early and try to get the ball in play because I don't want to get to two strikes and strike out. I'm just going to get the ball in play early. Well, now you start swinging at everything with less than two strikes. Now that's where weak contact comes from, and then you're going to be out and you don't really have much chance of success. So. Um, again, like with two strikes, we're covering roughly one ball off, um, and we're not really expanding from there away. But unlike sit away, where we're covering five baseballs, now we have to be able to adjust all the way back to black end. Now we're having to cover the whole play. It's hard. It's hard. But we're going to cover away first, and we'll fight like crazy in. Um, again, looking for ball five away, black away, and adjusting back in. Um, and I'm setting my timing. I'm setting my timing for my fastball a little bit later. Those five baseballs that you saw on the plate um, when these dudes were hitting, they're right there at the front of the plate. Like we're making contact in front of the plate, doing trying to do damage. 
with two strikes, they roll those five baseballs back to the back of the back of the uh, home plate. Now my contact depth on the fastball is deeper. And I'm trying to, as a right handed hitter, I'm trying to time my fastball, hitting the fastball, four hole first baseman, lefty, six hole third baseman, to give myself a better chance to be able to handle off speed pitches and see those things a little bit longer. So my timing is, is deeper with two strikes. Um, some of the things to think about. Um, we kind of, I, I'm not saying you make a big deal out of this, you don't bring this up to your players, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying as you're evaluating, as the season's going on and you're starting to kind of look at your team and you start evaluating as a coach, am I doing the things that's helping our guys win that they need? I, I start looking at one out of every seven plate appearances equals a strikeout. If you can strike out one time for every seven plate appearances, you're going to be a pretty good offense. You're going to be in the lead offense. So as a coach, as the season's going and you're starting to collect more and more information, I look at that like, okay, if we're striking out at a higher clip, maybe we need to hone in and try to try to do a little bit more two-strike work, or maybe we're, what we're doing is good. And so I kind of use that to kind of self-evaluate from there. Um, and then when training, when we're setting up training, some of the chase zones, the two primary chase zones when we're setting up training is breaking balls below the zone and fastballs above the zone. Really, chasing off in and out isn't near as common as up and down. So when we are training, we're trying to teach guys where does that breaking ball need to start height-wise so it's not below the zone, and that fastball, we're trying to keep them staying off the top of it, chasing out the zone up. So when we're training, those are the two, two times that we're really trying to expose them and like get them to chase so that they can understand this stuff. Uh, Two-strike approach, Talmud Lecoy, he was in the... Uh, in Coach Lee's stuff earlier, like this is a pretty good round with two strikes. You can see he's shifted the ball is over. He's sitting away, he's covering that, that black outside edge of the plate, adjusting all the way back in, and he's fastball rhythm and adjusting to the breaking ball. He's on time to hit that fastball at the four hole. Fastball. Probably a five and a half there. So just some unique things. One thing that I've kind of been thinking about, like, so you guys saw the, uh, the machine, the ability to be able to mix pitches. We're just rolling through those approaches every day. The things that we talked about, you know, earlier with the three rounds, fastball, spit, middle, two strikes, sit off speed, sit away, two strikes, sit in. Like, I want to get to a point where maybe we start mixing in some different type of situations. And I bring this up because you may face this guy this year. I want to start. I want to. I want to set up a day for um, on that machine where we're have sinker slider guy, ride curveball guy, fastball change guy. And honestly, these are the first three kinds of guys that come to mind. There's probably more that kind of start falling into this category. The sinker slider guy. You know, those are the types of guys that are going to start the fastball and the slider middle. One goes one way, one goes the other. It's basically finishing black. Or, you know, outside edge to both. Well, as a hitter, again with less than two strikes. You can't cover black and black. You have to pick one. You have to pick one. Either I'm going to cover the slider and sit away, or I'm going, to I'm going to sit in and cover the sinker. So you have to pick one. You can't cover both. Just like the ride, the ride heater, fastball, top of the zone, guy's got a little bit of carry, and the curveball, that's top, bottom, same thing. I can't cover the top of the zone and the bottom of the zone. I have to pick one. And then the fastball change guy. This is kind of a unique guy, too. Those guys, that's just kind of really steady mix, that both pitches are in the zone, kind of tough to see, whatever. Like, be okay hitting the fastball a touch later to give yourself a chance to change up. So these are some kind of unique guys. Again, sinker slider, can't cover both sides. Ride to the curveball, can't cover top bottom. And then the fastball change. Those guys that are really mixing, and maybe you're having trouble identifying, well, let's just kind of almost – Think kind of a little bit more of a two-strike type mentality, not expand, but in terms of timing, let's hit the fastball backside to give myself a chance with the changeup. Yeah. Talk about kill switch. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, how many people have um, mini hacks in here? Okay. So, one thing that we'll do with a mini hack um, is 
It's tough. You can do two strikes. You can do fastball spin. Um, it's, it's hard. So you can set up any three lane that you really want. As you're feeding that machine, do every time act like you're just all you gotta do is touch the on off button. Do just act act like and then every third, fourth, whatever you want to, just turn it off. Feed it. Those wheels start slowing down, and lose your power, and it comes out as a change up. Like it's tough. It's really tough. We call it kill switch. And so if you hit the switch and then feed it fairly quickly, like it'll stay in the zone. Hit the switch, grab a ball, feed it. Now it's probably slowed down enough and it ends up actually being a ball in the dirt and it's a test. So that, we call that kill switch uh, stuff. It's challenging. But to have a mini hack to do two strike stuff, you want to see some guys and their ability to adjust and hang in there and make decisions, late decisions. It forces you to be, you have to be willing to hit the fastball down the opposite field foul line. Otherwise, you're not gonna have a chance. It's awesome. <laughs> they, they compete. Like once they start to get the hang of it, like they will really, really compete in the cages to take the change up. Like when you hit that switch, hit the ball, cut the thing off, shoot another ball, they start figuring it out. When they first start doing it, now they're gonna throw the bat at you, but they're gonna run out of bat quick. But once they start to figure it out, I think it builds a ton of confidence to be able to apply to strike approach. So, I want to do it and talk about it. Yeah. It's yeah. just a drill. It's an awesome drill. So, you know, like, and, and kind of on that note, like, there's going to be times, especially for us, there's going to be times, whether it's a change up or whatever, we're going to face guys that have really good off speed pitches to the point where maybe there's not anything they're doing that sends up a red flag. That breaking ball's not popping. That change up, I can't see him slow his arm down. Like, there, I can't tell that it's an off-speed pitch until like I'm I'm gone and I'm in trouble. There's going to be times we face guys like that. Well, those are the guys that you like again. Fastball spit. The more convicted you are on the fastball, being fastball rhythm, fastball rhythm, fastball rhythm, and it's not there yet is what's going to tell me it's an off-speed pitch. So you're not always going to be able to identify spin, ball popping up, slowing the arm down, whatever, changing slot, lower slide. The rhythm itself, as you face better pitching, is going to help you identify that. Um, and I put this on here, like I'll say, this is the guys that I've worked with and I've seen them implement these things. I'm a believer, like I go and I hear these people speak, I'm a skeptic, like I, I'm like, okay, like, you know, like, it's all good in theory. It's great in theory, but like, will it really work? Well, I look back at some of the guys that I've coached with that have worked on this and done exactly what I've said and trained their guys and helped them understand how to implement it in games, and I'm going to show you some results. Campbell the last two years. Um, you can look at that. Um, runs per game, 9.62 last year. You look at 20, uh, 2022, 118 home runs, almost two home runs a game, slugging 548. You look at NC State with Chris Hart running this. I mean, unbelievable. ACC batting title, average slugging, total home runs. Sixth and seventh in home runs and home runs per game. They went through a stretch of feeding, had to be Kevin Cox, SEC Pitcher of the Year, Super Regional Arkansas. Brennan Beck, game one of the College World Series, second round draft pick. Jack Leiter, second overall pick, Vanderbilt in World Series. You had a stretch of three dudes to be, you have to afford, you, have, you have to really hone in on an approach and be sold out to be able to compete with some of these guys. And then the short season, I mean, some of those numbers are ridiculous. And then at UNC Greensboro with Link Jarrett running this, who's now the head coach at Florida State. Look at some of these numbers. These are all a result of having a plan, shrinking the zone, looking specific pitches based on how you're being pitched and not missing. And the more that you can shrink that, and the more you can hunt specific pitches, you're not going to miss, and you can do some real damage. Questions? How far, when you got your five balls, how far in front of the guys are they? Like front foot? Or Honestly, it's, it's got a guy. Most people will put it right at the front of the plate. If a guy feels like he's getting beat a little bit, he may push them out more to have that feeling. It's kind of, not only is it a five ball lane for the width I'm looking, but it also gives guys a point of reference for what they're trying to feel with their contact point too. You know, with less than two strikes, we're trying to win the front of the plate. With two strikes, we're trying to back those balls up and be able to see it deep. Any other questions? I got one. Yep. How did Campbell do against Gamecock? 
<laughs> coach Lee's a better hitting coach than I am. <laughs> Anything else? All right, thank you guys.